David, that's been an absolutely fascinating morning and thank you so, so much. Um, you've really, really challenged the audience and the students, I think. And it seems interesting because, I mean, I learned the bark sweets as a, as a child myself and I remember being told by a teacher, you must harmonise them all first. Go away and harmonise them all. And I sat at the piano and I did that. And then I said to my mother, I've done it now. And that was the end of it. I mean, we never talked about it again. And really what you've shown so well today is that it's fundamental to understand the harmony, to understand the actual telos of each suite and the structure. Um, do you find that that isn't what often happens when people approach these works? Well, the, the first thing is, I think the, uh, you know, working out the harmony, we assume it has to be on the piano. Yes. But of course it doesn't. That's you can do it on the cello. And what I've found is that as I'm experimenting with chords and um, first of all, it's, it's, it's reinforcing that connection between ear, fingers and brain. It's, it's helping me improvise by ear as I'm doing it. And then funnily enough, I found myself, oh, I found myself doing, an, I'm actually playing some Bach because he's come up with that idea mm. as a way of expressing that harmony as well. So I would say to students, don't do it at the piano. Do it, do it at the cello, you know, um, fingerboard harmony at the cello kind of thing. And of course, that's very much where this tradition of um, self-accompanied, because it's not really unaccompanied Bach, it's mm. self-accompanied Bach really comes from that tradition that's as old as the cello itself mm. of improvising chordal accompaniments on the cello and I think that's where it grows out of so it's really not a solo piece um, it's a it's a book of ways of harmonizing on the cello mm. and that and that in fact is even more challenging in a sense. Yeah. I mean, it was interesting, yeah. Christophe Quin, who's also played in Cello Unwrapped, mm. he said he took his students, he, he offered them Piatti's piano accompanied version from the 19th century, yeah. because he said that the students' harmony was really, that they didn't have enough knowledge of harmony to actually do it themselves. And it was, yeah. that was a way of helping them. I mean, it is terribly important, but not impossible, I'm sure you, you feel for them to go away and actually to actually understand those chords. Yeah. Well, in the same way that an actor, you know, if a director said to an actor, can you stress the verb in that sentence? And they go, what? You know, we, it's because it's our first language, um, we, you know, we know those terms, we know what's the adjective, we know what the verb is, we know what the noun is. Um, that simple grammatical relationship between those words, words like the, you know, we, we tend to sing music stressing all of the words because they're all important. And we end up with the syllable <laughs> being emphasized, emphasized even, um, in ways that we wouldn't naturally do because it's kind of posh cello playing. Mm. Um, and really, I think the only way, I mean, you could say, if, if somebody really can't spot a dominant seventh chord in a minuet, um, or a little saraband, you could say, to what extent are they interpreting that piece? You know, they're, they're mm. playing it, they're, maybe they're performing it, mm. but really, without that level of understanding, somehow, whether it's head, heart or gut, um, and we all approach these things differently, and it might just be a story, but, but um, to what extent is that person really understanding, understanding how the music works? and being able to convey it um, mm. if, if, those, if those levels of understanding aren't, aren't integrated. Mm. I mean, it's interesting you're talking about, you mentioned a verb there. A lot of what you were talking about just now is to do with these words that we use when we're playing music, dynamics. As you were saying yesterday, yeah. the opposite of dynamic is static. Mm. And yet we're told dynamics are things that you, you put on yeah. PP, or you put on loud, or you, you diminuendo, or mm -hmm. um, things like prelude, mm -hmm. to prelude, yeah. being a verb, um, even um, some of the other things were articulate. I mean, that's another word, articulation. Mm -hmm. I, I think even in sort of grade eight, oral, yeah. what's the articulation? Yeah. Legato, staccato. Mm. You were saying, no, no, it's about connection. Yeah. 
So all these words we use, they have slightly frozen yeah. some misunderstandings, haven't yeah. they? Well, they've become shorthand, mm. those words, and they've become, they've, they've changed over the years our understanding of what they, they could mean. And I think dynamic is, is probably the best example. Bach, you know, if you compare Stravinsky and 20th century composers, they, they are putting in, you know, Mahler writes several indications in each bar mm. of his music. Bach almost never writes any dynamic indications, but it doesn't mean his music is less dynamic. It means our job as a performer is to understand the dynamic of the music. Um, and Bach just chooses not to reveal it because he doesn't need to. He's got, he's got his slurs, he's got, uh, he's got his assumption that you'll understand French Baroque dance, mm. that you'll understand the way that his harmony works, the way that the contrapuntal voices work. I don't think Bach could probably ever have envisaged a generation of people playing his music who didn't know how to dance a minuet mm. in the same way that my grandparents would be astonished that nobody could dance a waltz. Yes, yes. I mean, talking of Bach and, and the relationship to today, these suites have become a, a text, have become a Bible, really, mm -hmm. for solo cello playing. Mm -hmm. I mean, your approach is very, very different. You're asking for a very radically different approach to them. Um, in a sense, I mean, you say they're self-accompanied, but they've become something that people wait their whole careers to perform as big solo pieces. What is it that you think is so important in, in approaching them? I think if you can, if you can bring together elements that are, that are also present in his other music, in Bach's you know, cantatas, the passions, the, you know, all of his other chamber music, um, rhetoric, harmony, dance, those three circles make a pretty amazing Venn diagram. And in the middle, that little shape in the middle where they overlap is really where is the place that this music occupies. Um, and it's very difficult to see that for any of the other sort of mainstream solo repertoire that we do as cellists. Um, the idea that we that we assume that each generation of cellists has improved, has sort of pushed forward the boundaries of technique. And my favorite one is liberated it from the baseline. <laughs> that, um, you know, that if a cellist wants to be liberated from the baseline, then we'll learn the violin. <laughs> you know? um, but if you're interested in the baseline and what, what that baseline involves, um, then there's a huge world of, of expressive possibilities that's there that, that are just free. If you can connect basic grade five theory type stuff with how you play your instrument, then that world is open to you. Mm. I mean, it's interesting because in Cello Unwrapped, we've obviously gone right back to the very big first music for cello, the, Gab the Domenico Gabrielli. And it was very clear in, there in that concert that this idea of liberation is, is, is an anomaly. It's not, it's not actually true. Even in those very early works, there was the bass and the treble and the melody line all happening yeah. at once. That, that is really what the cello can do. It's what it's yeah. about, isn't it? And, well, I think it's that those works, like the Bach, those works come from that world of, of um, reading figured bass on the cello, being an accompanist. The Corelli Opus 5 Sonata is a very good example from 1700, sonatas for violin and cello or harpsichord. It's not that the harpsichord player plays the harmony and the cellist plays a kind of bass line that sounds a bit like an imitation of the violin, but, you know, isn't. It's that either the harpsichord player is there doing these rich ten note chords or the cellist is there. And if they are there, what are they doing? You know, they're not just playing that line. They're, they're finding little patterns. And when I started doing that many years ago with John Holloway, um, I found very quickly, I found myself playing bits of Bach because it kind of fitted that, that language of Corelli. And it's the same, it's the same with all of those, uh, with uh, Deli Antoni, Gabrielli, those people that, 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 that they are cellists playing with this new instrument. You know, it's only really from 1st of January 1680 mm. that, the, that the cello starts existing as we know it. Um, and already they're using it in a way that, that, uh, that's much richer, I think, than mm. we assume. 
And it's, it's really the problem about this backwards telescope thing of looking down through Shostakovich, Britain, Vorjak, distant Bach, that, you know, if technique has always been improving, then who was that poor person that had to look at this thing? What was, you know, what was Gabrielli? You know, how did he play? Were they just not very good? I don't buy it. No. You know, I don't, I just don't buy that. Not at all. I mean, one of the interesting things you said, um, and all the cellists we've had today were playing on steel strings, mm -hmm. I think. Yeah. Modern bows, modern setups, and here are you coming from a very different background. Um, it, it's in a way, I thought it was going to be the elephant in the room, that a part of you would think, well, look, you can't really do this on these tools. But interestingly, you only mentioned that once to, to yeah. Joe, mm -hmm. when you said you're driving a Formula One car on a rather bumpy road, mm -hmm. and perhaps a, a Mini Cooper would, would suit this better mm -hmm. for the actual grip of, yeah. the, of the gut string. Yeah. I mean, what, what is your response to that when you're, you're listening to a lot of people playing in a very different, with very different tools? Yeah. Well, I think the, the sixth suite particularly is one where it really is written for a different instrument. Oh, yes, yes. Um, you know, we can, it's in that book of cello suites, but it's really the five-string instrument brings something completely different. Um, and the difficulty is that it, it takes it into a kind of Haydn cello concerto type area where it's about playing elegantly and harmonically, but very high up in thumb position. Of course, on the five string, it still goes very high, but most of it is in neck position. Um, and, you know, the way the instrument sings, the way the, the harmonics resonate, you know, there's a kind of angelic quality to the tone of the instrument. And the point I was trying to make with Joe was that, um, that when you play on a quite a thin gut E string, the, the bow really needs to grip the string a little bit more, um, or it won't speak at all. Um, I think really, I would, I think everybody should learn to play on a gut string only for nothing to do with performance practice, only because of what it teaches you about your bow control. Because it's like, did you ever play on gut strings, by the way? I had, I have once, yes. I mean, I, my teacher used to have a gut strung right. cello. So it's a bit like in tennis when, you know, an old fashioned racket mm. with gut strings, funnily mm. enough, you know, the sweet spot of that racket will be tiny. Yes. But, but nowadays they have a huge head with like, you know, uh, and the sweet spot's enormous. You just wave it near the ball and it's an amazing shot. So, so Joe was doing that. He was making a perfectly good sound mm. with, a, with a kind of okay point of contact and an okay control of his speed and pressure. Mm. But actually, if it was much, much more finely focused um, into that sort of smaller sweet spot, uh, the sound that there would have been another sound world open to him. Really. Mm. And in terms of the actual equipment, the Baroque bow, because that's the other thing, is steel yes. strings, modern cello, Baroque bow. Yes. I feel that that's a fetish, that, that, they, that people say, well, this is my modern bow, it goes like this, wah. This is my Baroque bow, it goes, <laughs> It doesn't. You know, it's a, you know, the modern bow is invented as a response to the sustained style that people were trying to develop, mm. that Tartini was trying to develop, the articulation at the tip style mm. that they were developing. Um, I think it's a mistake to ascribe to a piece of equipment that's inanimate any kinds of um, you know, attributes mm. at all. Um, it's really in our head and in our heart and what we do with our speed and pressure of bow and the way we control what we have. I think the, whether it's steel or gut, you know, I prefer gut, but um, I, it's not going to stop me working in this way with somebody who's playing on steel at all. I, I, for me, sorry, I, I think it's like cheese. You know, if you, the problem with gut strings is they go out of tune. Yes. So, you know, and they're harder to play. But if you went to a really fine restaurant and said, I'd like to see the, the cheese board, and they said, oh, well, we, we, our fromagier has retired and it's su such a nuisance looking after all that cheese and bringing it on and keeping it at the right temperature and humidity. So here's a craft dairy lee slice. <laughs> yeah, said, what? I, you know, that just wouldn't be good enough. Mm. And I think there's a richness of possibility in gut that's not there in steel, that, that, that you lose which, which we substitute for reliability.
but you don't feel that about the what you're saying about the bow is that is actually also very important but if you're going to play on steel strings you have to play with a modern bow there's no point no, suddenly th- playing with a baroque bow i think you can get something from playing with a baroque bow but um you know and there's one thing particularly that's easier to do and that's this this thing that I was talking about earlier, which is the three slow notes with a deep stroke, one fast light one. Mm. That is easier to do with a, a narrower band of hair and a lighter stick. Mm. That, that it kind of wants to, in, in, you feel the stick in your hand wants to do that more easily. Mm. Whereas this is a bit more of a kind of juggernaut with, a, mm. with, a, you know, with some modern bows. Um, mm. I mean, obviously a really beautiful modern bow will also do that really well. But it's nothing that we can't get over mm. with any equipment. Mm. And I've, you know, more and more and more, I've found myself actually not really noticing what equipment I'm using. That actually the focus is on the music rather than on, as Harnenkohl was saying in the 60s, it's the idea in your mind, not the equipment in your hands mm. that, that really makes.